here with with Graham Brady, Sir Graham Brady. Sorry, the uh, the king of the Tory backbenches, uh, MP for Altrincham and Sale West, chairman of the 1922. Graham Brady, hello. <laughs> hello. So, um, I thought at first I would just sort of ask you some questions about your time at Durham University because that's you know why Palatina is so eager to to talk to you. Um, you attended St Aidan's College. Uh, in the late eighties, can I ask? Did you did you choose Saint Aidan's? <laughs> um, yes, I did, um, and it was um, at the time. Of course, half the colleges were uh, mixed, and half were single sex. And having been at a boys' grammar school uh, <laughs> before that, I was quite keen to go to a, a mixed uh, college. <laughs> uh, it was, of course, I then ended up getting married to somebody from a college on the other side of Durham, uh, from Hilden Beach. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, and I don't know, would you say St. Aidan's was a, a very a nice college to go to, like good atmosphere? Or um, Yeah, I think so. Um, I certainly I've, I've got some very good friends who uh, I've met in St. Aidan's. Uh, I've got uh, friends from other colleges as well, but uh, I, um, my, uh, as I said, I married somebody who was at Hilden Bead, uh, but uh, Victoria's sister ended up marrying a friend of mine from St. Aidan's as well. So uh, it, it, it helps to keep people in touch. It's just one of the reasons I ask about Aidan's is because, I don't know, this might be a bit controversial. I feel like it's seen nowadays as a bit of a sort of mysterious zone where not many people dare venture. <laughs> Did it have that sort of atmosphere <laughs> back then? Or? <laughs> uh, I, I'm not sure that I would put it quite that way. Uh, the, the, the joke um, uh, back then was that because uh, Aidan's had been a, a women's college until I think it was 1979, not that long before, and um, the old the steps were known as um, because the number of people who've been put off uh, on the hill. Yeah, I think the steps play a bit of a factor too nowadays. Nowadays, yeah. Um, moving on from from Aidan's, one of the main questions I was very excited to ask you when you agreed to talk to me today was like, what was your favourite pub in Durham? <laughs> um, let me say, I'll prob probably say. Um, uh, well, actually, I had some very nice uh, times with the dunk, um, but also um, maybe one of those uh, just down at the bottom of um, of Old Elvert, uh, the Half Moon. I'm thinking um, yeah, Half Moon, uh, classic. <laughs> we, we sometimes uh, being up on the hill, we sometimes ended up. I think it's a, it's the New Inn, isn't it? Which is that still there near the library? Sadly, the New oh, Inn near where the library used to be. The new inn is oh, now right, a, very, okay. a very bourgeois cafe bar called White Church, which is a very nice place in its own respects, but it, it's no new inn. I mean, I, okay. have, I have some good memories of the new inn myself because it was the first pub I was served alcohol in. I think I was 16 or 17. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, it was a good place. Um, so, and when you were at Durham, you studied law. Um, do you have any sort of because listen i have quite a few people in my household who like study law and they're always like complaining and moaning and talking about how busy they are do you have any advice for struggling law students gosh i just won't cheer them up at all my my advice to people who are thinking of, of studying law at university is is not to and uh you know, i wish that I'd uh, read history instead. And I think given that you can do a, a conversion easily, um, but I, you know, I, I suppose like a lot of us um, in my generation, uh, I was first of my family to go to university. I didn't really have anybody to give me very good advice on things like that. Uh, so, you know, I, I guess it seemed like a good idea to save a, a year if you wanted to go on and, uh, and be a lawyer subsequently as it was i decided fairly early on that i i didn't want to pursue a career in the law either 
Uh, so as I wish I'd, I wish I'd read history instead. That's interesting that you wish you'd done history. I mean, I don't know, what do you think you might have like written your dissertation on if you had done history? Um, Paul, I've no idea. I, I, it's, it's, a, it's a long time ago now. I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I just thought you might be sort of extremely interested in, like, I don't know, medieval French history or something, but but no. <laughs> well, I mean, when I did A-level history, well, my sort of real interest, I suppose, was around the English Civil War. So uh, maybe that would have been the, uh, the <laughs> period to study. I always think that uh, uh, strikes me that in many ways it was... Um, studying that period as vocational training for <laughs> uh, life in in the House of Commons. Yeah, especially in the past three or four years, maybe. <laughs> Sometimes, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so speaking of, you know, House of Commons, you've obviously been an MP for 20 years now. Wikipedia says you're a Durham University Conservative Association chair. I, I hope that's true because I'm going to ask you a question about it. Um, why when you were a sort of young adult, why were you a conservative? And is it for the same reasons you're a conservative now? Um, I, I, I don't think my politics haven't changed very much. Um, uh, I certainly at that point uh, in the 1980s under Margaret Thatcher's uh, leadership, the conservative party was the more radical party in British politics, so not necessarily a small c uh, conservative party, it was modernising the economy, it was making significant changes. And I suppose uh, what spoke to me was the absolute belief in opportunity, in social mobility, uh, and uh, those certainly are things that have driven my um, political life uh, since as well. Uh, so um, I, I guess those are the things that are particularly motivated me. Also, I suppose it's worth saying, uh, for people of my age, I'm 53. I was uh, 15, uh, 14, 15, when the Falklands War was happening. Uh, it was a, a very uh, critical moment, really, in British uh, history, because having grown up in a, a, a country which was sort of widely regarded as... Uh, the sick man of Europe, a bit of a laughing stock, not uh, uh, a country that had been in decline for uh, decades. It did seem to be the moment when Britain uh, showed some real resolve and self-confidence, and that kind of crystallised the sense that uh, Britain wasn't a, a, a sort of failed, declining country. That's interesting, yeah. I can sort of see how that can trace up to you, like, support of Brexit, for example, and the politics you've sort of pursued in your career as an MP. Um, was Durham a very left-wing place when you were there? Because, like, I would say on balance it is now, but I don't know, maybe the demographics were probably a bit different in the 80s, so maybe it was less so then. Um, I, I'm not sure how the demographics have changed. I've been back um, reasonably frequently and spoken at, at events and debates over the years um, and you know certainly there's uh, I, I guess quite a middle class sort of demographic quite a lot of people from independent schools um, and you know maybe not quite as much now as them but I would say it's still quite a strong uh, strand uh, in the student population. Um, was it left-wing now? Um, you know I, I guess uh, universities often have uh, an element of uh, left-wing uh, politics around them uh, and you know frequently people it's, it's an old uh, an old saw to say that life is like reading a book it's a steady journey from left to right um, but um, uh, that sometimes uh, works uh, but I uh, no, I would say that uh, Durham was quite a conservative university but probably uh, more of a small c conservative university a lot of people who simply didn't engage in politics at all uh, one of the uh, tasks I suppose and challenges was just to try to make sure that you could get people to engage and you know, that was certainly what I tried to do when I was chairman of the uh, Conservative Association of Durham. That is interesting you've sort of um, foreshadowed my next question there because I would say at the moment certainly with regard to the sort of student union and stuff there's a very sort of 
polarized like febrile atmosphere about about student politics at the moment um and you seem to be saying that, that just people weren't really bothered <laughs> back then like it was a much less politicized atmosphere i think the students union was um i i suppose left leaning um and there were certainly lots of people very involved in uh, dsu who were uh, were of the left uh, but I would say that the vast majority of students didn't have very much to do with uh, DSU. And I guess that's partly because there was more focus on uh, the JCR in, in the colleges. Um, but uh, also perhaps it, it didn't particularly appeal to people because it was uh, a, a sort of slightly angry uh, <laughs> left wing uh, view of the world. Yeah, I, uh, I won't comment on that. but. Um... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's that's interesting yeah and um the last question i was going to ask you about the sort of the durham days before we move on to politics a little bit um say aiden's college food was it edible um yes i wouldn't say it was great um <laughs> Uh, and, and sometimes there wasn't very much of it, um, especially you know in the cold winter. If you've had to walk up that hill all the time, uh, you did burn some some calories. Uh, there was a, a wonderful moment. Uh, Irene Highmarsh, who was the college principal uh, back then, uh, was summoned to the junior common room uh, to deal with a, a big protest about the uh, size of portions uh, that were being served in uh, in St Aidan's. And um, uh, she was uh, a very um, uh, charming and uh, uh, smart, uh, fairly elderly lady even at, at that point. And uh, when a few colleagues, a few um, students in the JCR got up and, uh, and started to have a go about this, she then responded with a, a twinkle in her eye and a, a, a very a beatific smile. And she said, but might it not be a good idea uh, for one of the larger men uh, to go through in the queue with one of the smaller girls and then maybe the, the um, uh, chap could have uh, some of the food that the girl didn't want to have, <laughs> um, which I, I, I'm not sure she would have got away with now, but uh, uh, it, it produced a, a certain amount of amusement and, uh, and, and certainly probably made a few people think they might possibly make some new uh, friendships if they, if they followed that advice. Yeah, I mean, you might be happy to hear, you know, I'm at St. John's College and one thing about the food, the portion sizes are not small. It's sort of mountains of potatoes <laughs> on, the, on the plate every night. So I've never been hungry, I'll say that. <laughs> so um, if we can sort of move on to the politics stuff in general, I'm talking to you right now from a Durham with a much reduced student presence. Do you think universities will see students return this academic year? Uh, yes, but I um, and, and I know a lot of a lot of people are actually at the uh, universities for one reason or another. In fact, we've got a, a, a nephew who's um, uh, just gone back to Durham because he's got um, uh, a lot of essays to write and he needs certain books from the library that he couldn't get uh, at home. Uh, so I know there are a fair few uh, people around, but um, I'm very conscious that by this point, uh, coming up towards Easter, um, most of another year has passed, most of another academic year has passed. Uh, so you know, I think for people, uh, certainly if, it's, if this is their final year, um, they've missed out on a huge amount of uh, uh, university life and, uh, and I think that's a, a really uh, tragic uh, situation. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I know, you know, the, the 21st of June is, is the date we've all sort of circled on our calendars. And it's been a very long 12 months for, you know, for students and obviously for everyone in the, in the world, pretty much. Um, I don't know. I mean, how ironclad do you think that date really is? Do you think the Conservative Party would revolt if it looked like that date would slip away? Well, I think the difficulty with this, the government said quite reasonably that it was going to be driven by the data, not by dates. 
and then published the roadmap, which has got more dates in it than <laughs> uh, anything else. And the use of the words no earlier than in relation to all of those uh, dates, I think is a real cause for concern because there is uh, good grounds for hoping uh, that we're in a very rapid uh, period of decline in the levels of COVID in the country, uh, dropping away uh, around about 30% a week uh, at the moment. So a very rapid decline in the number of positive test results, equally rapid decline uh, in hospitalizations and uh, or almost equally rapid decline in hospitalizations and a slightly faster decline in the number of deaths. And I think probably alongside a seasonal effect, which is beneficial, we're seeing the huge success of the vaccination program, um, which is now protecting the vast majority of those people who are most likely to be vulnerable. Uh, so it does seem to me that there's a great potential upside in the data that we might find that things are improving much faster than had been expected. Um, and yet the government's roadmap says, however good the data is, um, we're not going to open these things up before uh, those dates. Interesting. So you think it should be sort of elastic both ways? Like if cases are sort of yeah. rising too much, then by all means postpone. But equally, if things are going better than you might have expected, there's no reason to not do it faster. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I also uh, uh, said many times I've got some very profound reservations about the kind of restrictions that have been put in place. And, you know, I, I personally, I think that the state has reached far too deeply into people's private and personal uh, lives in legislating as to whether people are allowed to see their children or their grandchildren, yeah. uh, whether people are allowed to form a new relationship. And, you know, the point earlier in the year when we had uh, Matt Hancock appearing on the uh, television, I, I think it was actually um, uh, in the summer of last year, uh, telling people they weren't allowed to have sex with somebody unless it was an established partner. This is just something which is, you know, much, much too far uh, for government and for the state to, to, to do. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with you completely there. And also unenforceable, really. So you kind of don't even see the point of, I don't know, of, of trying to tell people they can't do it. Um, I know for a fact that very few students will have observed that, for example. Um, why not just focus on the stuff you can control? I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously you're a senior Tory MP, you're not going to criticise the government too much, but um, do you have any sort of, any more regrets about the way this has been handled, the restrictions we've had, like, you know, schools not being able to open, you know, playgrounds being shut. Have we gone a little bit too far? I, th I think the government has gone too far throughout the uh, pandemic. Um, we um, saw uh, right back at the beginning uh, last March, almost a year ago, uh, we could see that the um, levels of infection had started to fall before the first lockdown happened. We saw the same with the third lockdown as well. So um, it, it does seem that there has been a level of restriction or behavioral change short of lockdown, which has had a significant uh, effect. Um, so I, I think what we should have sought to do um, is maintain as much freedom as is safe. So, you know, looking, right way back uh, after when we were about three weeks into the uh, first lockdown, we were already getting evidence that the outdoor environments uh, were likely to be significantly safer. And you know, I posed the question then, why was it uh, legal for me to go and buy flowers in my local Tesco's, but not at the local outdoor market, uh, which just seemed uh, wrong in, in every way. Uh, and was needlessly uh, inhibiting somebody's freedom to earn a living as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I think if you start at that sort of premise, why can't you have uh, sales in outdoor markets? Uh, why would you uh, restrict 
uh, outdoor sports when they'd closed down tennis courts and golf courses and God knows what else, um, it, it seemed to be obviously counterproductive. Um, and uh, at the same time as telling people uh, that you wanted them to um, keep fit and lose weight and all the rest, you told them they had to stay indoors uh, and not do any exercise, um, or at least not do any, any outdoor sports. Yeah, I mean, it seems, it seems to me that, like, we saw countries that were badly affected before us, like Italy, locked down in a certain way and sort of felt the need to, to copy them quite closely. But as I think what I understand you to be saying is, like, we could have sort of thought outside the box a little bit more right from the start, use our initiative a bit with regard to, like, outdoor transmission, you know. Yeah, I don't know, it's... it's I wouldn't have wanted to to be making the policy myself. That's for sure because there's so many trade offs on either side. But I, I think that's a it's a fair point, and you know I, I have been very critical of the government's response over the last year, but always trying to be uh, fair as well. And so you know I, I certainly uh, would always say that this has been tough. It's been a, a real challenge for people to uh, find the right. Uh, position. Uh, you know, my uh, instinct is just that government should have trusted people more and should have helped people to make sensible accommodations with uh, COVID rather than trying to control people all, all of the time. Yeah, fair enough. Um, we can stop talking about COVID for a little bit. So you'll be happy to hear. Um, when you became an MP in 1997, your constituency in Greater Manchester was a marginal seat. And then over the next 20 years, it became less marginal and pretty much a safe seat. Until in 2017, your majority was halved back to sort of, I think, 6,000 or so. Are you scared that Keir Starmer's Labour Party might eject you from the House of Commons? Um, I I think it's best not to be too scared in uh, <laughs> politics. I think the uh, sensible thing is to uh, do what you can do uh, to be honest and straightforward about what you believe and uh, and, and then trust your constituents. Um, I think um, if you look at, at Altrim and Sale West, which I mean, it's my hometown, uh, it's uh, obviously an area that I know extremely well and have quite a lot of uh, empathy with the people who uh, live there. And, you know, I, I guess over a period of uh, 20, nearly 24 years now, um, representing the constituency in Parliament, people do get to have an idea of what kind of person you are, uh, whether they can uh, trust you when the chips are down to stand up for local interests. Um, and, you know, people have got very little excuse for, um, for for not knowing me after <laughs> this much this much time. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think um, I, I just try to serve uh, to the best of my ability. Um, and you know, sometimes you do get some very uh, nice feedback that comes from people. Um, I remember uh, one lady that I said. Uh, society type uh, things very involved in uh, protecting the local environments and things like that and uh, she bumped into me in the street once just around about election time she said you know I think you're a very good MP she said uh, I don't agree with you about um, grammar schools or, or about Brexit um, but I really like the fact that you make your own mind up and don't just take the position that your party uh, tells you um, and you know so sometimes people can respect you without agreeing and that's fine um, sometimes they might uh, make decisions on how to vote based on uh, the work that you do and how responsive you are as a member of parliament rather than just your politics my favorite was a, a lady when i knocked on her door and uh, i was about to introduce myself she said i know who you are uh, you're making my life really difficult and I thought, oh no, what have I done? And she said, you see, I've been a socialist all my life, but I think you're a really good MP and I don't know what to do in the election. Well, you know, those are compliments uh, I think we'll all take. Fair enough. So you seem a little bit reticent to reveal whether you 
see the current iteration of the Labour Party as more of a threat, though. As you say, maybe you just don't want to think about it too much. Well, I, I just think, of course, it's early days. We're quite a long way away from a, a general election. Uh, the signs at the moment are that Keir Starmer isn't really breaking through. And, you know, he's got quite poor approval ratings. Uh, the Conservative government retains an opinion poll lead overall, uh, which after the year that we've just been through is, is quite remarkable. Uh, so uh, I don't think that the current uh, Labour Party is looking um, that um, impressive uh, at the moment, but there's time for things to, things to change. Um, I guess I'd say that I think the Corbyn leadership was much more worrying for the country. I think if we'd had uh, a Labour government that left wing, uh, then I would have been really quite concerned about that. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not surprised. Um, we don't have too much time left. I'd sort of said this would be about half an hour or so. So I suppose the last thing I'll ask you is, why should a young adult in 2021 want to go into politics when the atmosphere in politics in general seems so, how do I put it, I don't know, toxic, unappealing? I, I think it's a really important question, Paul, and one that I, I think all of us engaged in politics ought to be very concerned about. I think, you know, especially for... Uh, newer members of parliament and younger members of parliament coming in uh, to, the, to the house over the last few years um, and the enormous impact of social media in the way that they campaign and the way they communicate with their constituents uh, and I think that leads to an even greater level of um, toxicity and unpleasantness uh, some really vile um, uh, abuse that people go through and I think it's been a particular problem for some of the uh, female uh, members of parliament have been targeted uh, even more. So you know, I think it's a really serious problem um, and we ought all to try to uh, do something about it. It's, um, uh, I, I think it goes beyond uh, parliamentary uh, politics. I think there is a less tolerant um, uh, view abroad. Uh, I think um, uh, people seem to be far less capable of engaging in an open, honest debate and uh, respecting their opponent in that uh, debate, um, which I, I just think we need to get back to. Why should a young person uh, go into politics today for the same reasons that young people did when, when I went into politics or before that? Uh, because you want to uh, make a difference, you want to improve the country, you want to improve the world. Um, and uh, you know, I think one of the things that I suspect will be a really big uh, issue in the coming years is going to be the question of to what extent uh, people are able to reclaim the freedoms that have been taken away from them by government over the last year. Uh, so, you know, I, I would like to see people coming in uh, to fight uh, against uh, the idea that government can simply um, uh, remove fundamental human rights uh, from people, the uh, freedom of association, the freedom to uh, form a relationship, the right to family life. These are absolutely fundamental things. And if we're not careful, we will lose them. So Graham Brady, thank you so much for your time, thanks for talking to me. Um, my regards to family and everyone else.